Hello. Hello, everyone. I hope you've had a very nice lunch and you're ready for our next presentation in the open business track. Similar to an earlier presentation that we had, we are going to talk about licensing and how both the open source community and business can benefit from having, in this case, a dual license for what they are doing. Here to talk about to talk to you about dual licensing will be Maria Dibay's own Asen, who is a senior R&D engineer who has a very big background in the IT industry, almost 20 years. So please give it up for Asen. Thank you, thank you and welcome to this uh, not so technical session in which we're going to talk about the business source licensing. My name is Asen and I'm a software engineer with Maria DB. Uh, software licenses. This is not exactly what technical guys are up to, so my mission today is to try and uh, talk a little bit about stuff that is not so common. A quick summary of what we're going to see today. So first of all, we're going to talk briefly about why licensing matters at all. We're going to examine different monetization models uh, which are common throughout the open source world. We're going to talk about the MariaDB business source license, why it came to be, why we had to invent something new, uh, and Hopefully, you'll join me on this journey from the very beginning to the very end uh, that created this uh, very, very interesting, from our perspective, license. And finally, we will have a questions and answers session. So uh, if your curiosity um, leads you to, to ask, asking questions, please save them for the end of the session, and we'll have enough time to discuss them. So without further ado, why licensing matters? Let's try and demystify these two letters. Uh, what, what do you mean when you see IP? What does it tell you? Yeah, this is a good hint because I was expecting to hear that for most technical guys, you know, it means internet protocol. But today for us, it will have a different meaning. It, it's no less uh, important to know what intellectual property mm -hmm. is all about. So when you write even a single line of code, your developers, at least I presume that some of you have written code. Whenever you write a line of code, it suddenly becomes your intellectual property. So suddenly you get something on your name. Uh, and you can't really touch it. Uh, you, can't, uh, you can't sniff it. You can't taste it, but it's still your property. Uh, so uh, at some point in time, of course, you want to do something with your property. If you have some real property, a real estate, you can uh, lend it out and you go and sign a contract for this. But how do you deal with your intellectual property? Well you have to license it. And the license is actually a form of contract between you as the licensor, the owner of the IP, and everybody else who's going to use your product uh, from now on. So we should not forget that software licenses have been around us for many, many years, essentially since the dawn of computing. The moment people start writing code and distributing code, they needed a way to deal with this. So software licensing has been around for many years, and being a good developer means that you need to have at least certain level of understanding how software licensing works. Uh, I'm not going to do a, a, a very deep dive into this, but uh, all the software licenses that are out there in the wild, uh, we typically split them into two big groups. So the first of them are the restrictive licenses. Judging by the name, they give you a very limited set of rights what you can do with this, uh, with this piece of uh, technology. For example, they only let you run the software on one machine, or they only let you run the software at a specific number of uh, CPUs, uh, cores, whatever. So you really get uh, only non-exclusive, little, very, very restricted rights on doing something with the software. And borrowing from the very early days of printing when circulation of books and newspapers and, and printed media was quite important, uh, the term copyright emerged, and it's still used for this type of licenses because essentially the licensor retains the right to copy the software or to distribute the software in our case. That's why we call them copyright licenses. Now, interestingly enough, copyright licenses are good in protecting innovation because the owner of the IP has incentive to keep innovating, to keep improving the product, bringing up new version, more functionalities, fancy stuff that little people will uh, like. But because he has to charge for this, because of the distribution model, which intrinsically comes uh, with proprietary licenses, proprietary licenses, copyright is bad at spreading things. At the opposite end of the spectrum, of course, we have a big, and, uh, a big set of licenses which is probably familiar to you, the permissive licenses. So 
uh, judging by their name, of course, they give you the freedom to use, to modify, to distribute the software to different degrees depending on the actual license that uh, you face. Uh, and because they are some, somewhat opposite, and because they waive certain rights, we often call them copy left licenses, which is a very nice uh, play of words, of course, because not only left is the opposite of right, but also because certain rights have been left to you so that you may uh, benefit from them. Uh, now, quite opposite to, to the previous, copy left is very good at spreading uh, software in our case, but whatever it's licensed under copy left, because, well, it's essentially free to use. But Copyleft is surprisingly bad at protecting uh, the intellectual property because since you start giving away your code for free, anybody can take it and can do more or less everything that he wants to, depending on the exact license that you have put there. So this essentially uh, removes your incentive to, to do a lot of things there. Uh, a very quick word on the, on the GPL, the GNU General Public License, which is quite familiar to all of you, uh, no doubt. It has been around for decades and is often wrongly, wrongly considered to be uh, the same thing as open source. But of course, open source is much more than just um, GPL. Uh, GPL proclaims uh, certain uh, freedoms, the four main freedoms of GPL. You should also be familiar with this. So you can freely use the software, you can freely uh, get the code for the software, you can modify this, so this is very, very important. And of course, you can uh, distribute the modifications that you make um, to other people. So all in all, GPL seems to be a, a, ver a very nice uh, thing. Uh, other important thing about GPL is that it mandates the retention of the license. So if you get the GPL piece of something, you cannot change the license to something else. And this is actually a key in protecting GPL. It protects itself from you know, evil people who are going to take something which is GPL and convert it into something that would be not GPL. Uh, another important aspect of GPL, which is important for the business, is that any modification that you make to a GPL product uh, still have to be GPL, because whenever you create a derived product, this is a term which GPL uses, when you create a derived product, it has to be under the same license. So if you just modify the code uh, of a GPL program, it still uh, remains GPL. If you even link something to a GPL program, then this something, your library perhaps, also has to be GPL. This is because a derived work is created, and GPL mandates that all the derived work stays under GPL. For the latter, there's actually an exception, which is called uh, the library or the lesser GPL license, which ex specifically exempts linking third parties' uh, products to GPL from being getting tainted by the GPL. So in this case, you could have a proprietary library being uh, used in a, in a GPL product without actually uh, tainting this uh, proprietary library. And the opposite, of course, using open source libraries in a proprietary product without tainting the product. But nevertheless, despite the fact that GPL is a great license and it has done a lot for um, the open source community. It possesses a problem to the business. Imagine if all the software was under GPL, everybody would be free to use it. So, isn't this great? Don't we all love free beer? Yes, we do, but surprisingly, a huge percentage of the open source software projects fail. And this number stays almost the same throughout the years. So this is a, a study from 2013, but if you take a recent one, it will, it will show essentially the same number. Four-fifths of all the open source projects die within uh, two years of their creation. So let's look again at the business problem that we have with GPL. Now, because you developers, you need pizza, you need Coke, you need laptops to work on, uh, sometimes you want to travel to OpenFest, for example, GPL cannot out-of-the-box give you this. Ultimately, this leads to an interesting paradox, meaning that open source software tend to be inferior to uh, proprietary software because you only get uh, university students, uh, graduates, working uh, enthusiasts working on, on purely open source software. Uh, while, uh, of course, the moment they leave the university, the moment they have to start making money, uh, get families, you know, they cannot sustain themselves any longer on just uh, pure open source products. This means that we need to somehow resolve the conflict. We need to find a way to monetize on free software, but without hurting its freedom. And this turned out to be a surprisingly tricky business. Let's take a quick look at monetization and, and open source. You know, Asian Greeks uh, said that it is the dose which defines the, po the poison. So it's not the poison itself. It just it matters how, how much you take in. So the same goes 
exactly with, with monetization. Uh, we have defined three important things about monetization uh, and open source. So the first thing is try to keep the open nature of the software as much as possible, even if you have to monetize on this. You know, the second thing is monetize only as much as you have to. And to have to means to sustain your business. So don't be greedy. Greediness is a cardinal sin. Don't fall for it. Uh, monetize just as much as you have to. And of course, give back to the community as much as possible. Don't just give some bits and pieces now and then. Try to give back everything that you create to the community for its benefit. So when we embarked on this, on this relatively long journey, we started looking at what monetization models are available. Of course, we wanted to take something that already exists and use it in our business. Nobody wants to spend time and effort creating something new if you can or, or reuse something that has been around. Uh, what we found was that uh, there are a number of monetization models on the, on the, on the market, if you want, uh, but each of them has a problem. And the major problem is that each of these models would somehow break at least one of these three important things which I mentioned on the previous slide. Uh, if we now look at uh, what is still available, what, what we studied as, as a possible approach to, to monetization. Number one, something that you've all seen around, uh, no big deal, of course, no brainer, selling support services to, to an open source. So it's very easy to do, everybody can do it. You don't really have to be a big company for this. Uh, it's pretty natural for, for a startup, for just a couple of people to start selling support services. Uh, and uh, actually, it's still one of the most common approaches to monetization, so there's nothing bad about it. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of companies do it, but there's a but. Uh, this type of monetization does not create uh, a drive for innovation. Why? Because pretty often the company which sells the support services is not the company which creates the product. It's just an open source product that you found somewhere, you got yourself trained in, in using it, you suddenly realize that certain businesses uh, could benefit from your support because it's a kind of a geeky, techy product that nobody uh, really wants to, to go deep into, and you start selling support services, but you're not the developers for this product. So, obviously, your drive, your, your incentive to innovate is relatively little. What you really want is just to be able to sell your services. The second downside of uh, just selling services is that this leaves your business vulnerable to competition. Why? Because the competition may just come in and say, hey, these guys are doing uh, fine, they're making some nice money, why don't we do the same? Uh, we are better trained, we have more people, we can try and sell at slightly lower prices so that we, we would undermine their business, undercut their prices, uh, try to steal their customers, uh, and eventually we'll thrive ourselves. But this leaves your business vulnerable. And there's at least one prominent example from, from the, about 10 years ago, and it's still around, this is Oracle versus Red Hat. Red Hat has been around for over 25 years now, and in the, in the early 2000s they created the Enterprise Linux, and they started selling support subscriptions for this. And in 2006, Oracle came in and said, hey, why don't we do the same? They just took the Red Hat sources, they brought up something they called Unbreakable Linux, and it's still around. So, of course, this leaves a business vulnerable to this kind of exploit. Another model for monetization that you may find around is the model of the open core. This means that only part of the product is, is open source. Typically, this is the core functionality of something, so the very basic things, uh, the nucleus of this product, while everything else, uh, some extensions, uh, plugins, so in most cases, important to business functionality stays uh, closed source, and you have to pay some sort of a fee, royalty, subscriptions, whatever you, uh, the license mandates you. The problem with this uh, that you can easily identify is that pretty hard to find good balance between what is in the open core and what is in the proprietary part. Because if you put too much in the open core, then, well, everybody would be happy just running your open core and you will get very few customers willing to pay for the extended functionality. So this would be bad for your business. The opposite is also bad for your business because if you leave in the open core too little, then people will find it very hard to actually try and understand how they can benefit from your product. This means that there will be very, very few uh, adopters and your business will once again struggle to find um, good, good adoption. Uh, also a bad thing with the open core is that nothing really is shared back with the community because you, know, you only have the open core, which is fine, but the, the, the neat stuff, uh, the goodies, what the business really like, it, it can never go back to the community because you have to keep it proprietary to make your model 
uh, work for you. And another downside is that a competition may still go after you. They may still put your business at risk. How? By forking your open core, because it's open, and then providing replacements for your proprietary components, either for free or for a very reduced price, so that your business would eventually struggle with this. And again, there is a very good recent example for this. Elasticsearch for, has been for many years known as one of the champions of open core and a company which was supposed to do well under the open core model. But recently, Amazon said, okay, um, we want to have Elasticsearch, but we also want to have the extended functionality, but we don't want to pay Elasticsearch for this. So what they did, they just forked the core and they rewrote all the extended functionality, and now it's released by them as, as open source product, which is a huge blow, of course, on Elasticsearch. A third model that we examined uh, while looking for a good business model for open source was dual licensing. It's also been around for many years. Lots of products have been dual licensed. Uh, but the thing he here is that uh, you really can only use a semi-open license uh, as your first license because uh, then you have to ask for a commercial license if you want to have some full-scale commercial operations on this. And the problem is there is a conflict between these two. Uh, you, you can easily see, and hypocrisy is the least thing that you can be accused of if you dual license the product. But there are even bigger problems with this, uh, because you can't really have a true open source license as your first license, because, well, then everybody would just fork the product, take it away from you. So you have to stick to some semi-open license, quasi-open license, that is uh, barely open just so you know that you would say that, hey, we're dual licensing, uh, but in fact, you're not really bringing back to, to the community whatever it is. Deserves. And a good example for this was uh, the ZFS from Solaris, which struggled for many, many years to find a good adoption. Uh, it was dual license, but its uh, open or, or semi-open part was, was not a truly open source license, and it never got adoption, for example, uh, in its original form in the Linux world. Speaking of uh, quasi-open licenses, an interesting thing that we spotted re uh, recently in the past year, and it's probably worth uh, a, quick, a quick note, it's the it's the approach of replacing a truly open source license with a custom one that is probably not an open source license. Uh, why does it happen? Because certain companies got fed up with their own open source stuff being exploited by bigger uh, market players who would just take the software, provide it as a service, benefit for this, and then give nothing back to the original um, vendors. We call this strip mining. Uh, and uh, one way they found to, to combat this is to actually change the license of their products. Now, the problem with this, of course, is that the new license is no longer an open source license. Uh, so you go, to, you go to OSI, the Open Source Initiative, you go to the Free Software Foundation, uh, which are the, the two biggest authorities that we have on open source, and they will both tell you that this is no longer an open source license, which means that the innovations that you make from this point on cannot be shared back with the community. This is a big problem. But it also means that truly open source vendor will start avoiding your product. Uh, for example, Linux distributions will stop including your software if they did before because it's no longer open source. They have no uh, incentive and some of them really dislike putting anything that is not uh, open source in their uh, uh, bundles, in their distributions, in their products. So there's another pain point for you. And it still leaves the product vulnerable to being forked from its last known open source version uh, in a, such a survival race uh, that could be imposed on you by these bigger players, which are typically nowadays cloud vendors. Uh, and one such example is MongoDB, which changed its license from being an open source license to some proprietary license which they invented. And nowadays in Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8, there is no longer MongoDB because it's no longer open source. Uh, but MongoDB is still vulnerable to these cloud vendors just forking the, the last known open source version and uh, starting improving this one. And uh, one last model that we, exp that we uh, uh, researched and uh, found to be, well, uh, at least uh, well known, if not uh, widely used, was the fair source license. Now, first of all, the fair source license is not an open source license. This should be known. The source code for this is visible. You can get it, but it's mostly window shopping. So you can't really do what you would normally do with the source code of an open source project. Uh, its uh, usage is usually restricted on base of uh, related to the users. So how many users can use this software for free, when you need to, to get some other type of license typically paid, and so on. Uh, again, nothing is truly given back to the community because the source is not truly open. And uh, the, another downside is that uh, it has limited usability. So if you have a mobile application, this could probably work for this. But if you're doing a, a database, if you're doing backend uh, 
uh, development is probably not going to work for this. So uh, its usability could be quite limited. And finally, this is not a new good thing uh, uh, whatsoever. Uh, other even prominent products like QML have been under similar license for many years. So you could get the source code, but you can, could not touch the source code. You could not uh, redistribute the source code uh, with modifications and so on. So after doing all this review, we came to the question, is there really an intrinsic conflict between being open source and living on this by monetizing on it? And after spending some, some time on this and after thinking a lot on this, we, we're happy to have proven that there is no such conflict, that there is a path which uh, satisfies both. So here comes the MariaDB business source license. So why did we decide to create a new license after all? Well, we did not like any of these monetization models which I described because of the downsides which I mentioned. Uh, we have actually been selling support to MariaDB for a number of years, so we're quite familiar with some of these models. We did not just study them, we have actual hand-on experience with them. But we figured out that just selling support is insufficient to sustain true innovation and improvement on the product. We didn't like, we didn't like open core because we, ne we would never be able to, to give back to the community what we really wanted. We didn't want to do dual licensing because MariaDB's roots are essentially in, in, in open source, in GPL, and we didn't want to, to, to engage in this uh, hypocritic play of uh, uh, what kind of license you have and when you need a commercial license and when you can go open source and so on. We didn't want to betray our own past. Uh, we wanted to stay true to the open source promise. We wanted, uh, that's why we did not want to replace an open source license with something that pretends to be, but in fact it isn't. So, to summarize why we did this, we wanted to be able to push innovation while preserving the open nature of what we did. We wanted to protect our innovations from being abused from third parties uh, simply because they are bigger, fatter, faster than us and have exposure to a larger number of customers. And we wanted to ensure that the community will 100% benefit from our innovations in the same way as any current business does. So, let's take a look at the main features of the business source license as we create them. First of all, under the business source license, the source code is always available, both to the users of the product and to non-users. So if you just want, to, you just want to, to peek around, please, you have access to the source code. Everybody is allowed to use the product without restriction, for free, if doing so for non-production use. And if you want to do production work, then you need to obtain a separate license from the licensor. And it's important to know that we don't say it has to be a paid license. We're just saying it has to be a separate permission uh, from the uh, intellectual property owner. But uh, yes, and the vendor, of course, may still provide some exceptions of the above because it's the vendor. But is this really all about it? Doesn't this slide seem to be from some other presentations, or some before? Doesn't this seem to be just another corporate, you know, uh, fancy stuff, masking stuff? Is there really a killer feature for the BSL? And yes, the answer is there is a killer feature in the BSL. And the killer feature of the BSL is called the change date. This is a fixed date after which the BSL expires and will be automatically replaced by what we call a change license, which has to be an open source license. So from the change date on, the open source license applies to the product. Two important things. Once set, the change date cannot be modified. So you cannot later say, oh, I changed my mind, I want to extend this uh, protection period so I could make more money out of this. No, it doesn't work. One said the change license cannot be modified. You cannot say, oh, I changed my mind. I want to put a more restrictive license so that I could keep selling some stuff around this and making some money out of it. No go. Another important uh, fact, the substitution of license is automatic. It does not require any action on the actual uh, IP holder. Even this IP holder goes out of business, vanishes, disappears. This change will still happen and this code will still become available to the community. So how do we compare business source license to other monetization models? Let's do a quick uh, round on this. Uh, open core versus uh, business source licensing. Open core, as we said, is not open despite its name, while for BSL, the source code completely in its, in its entirety is available to everybody. In open core, you don't have access to the source. You cannot contribute to this. In BSL, you have the source code and your contributions are welcome and encouraged. Open Core, it provides you essentially the same level of vendor lock-in because you, you normally lock in there because of the extended features which are not free. 
BSL. BSL guarantees you that the code will become open source, and open source means you're free from any kind of vendor lock-in. With dual licensing, if it's dual licensing, companies must pay for a commercial license always to use the software with their closed source code. While in BSL, companies only pay uh, for the software if they use it above certain thresholds that are defined by the vendor, not by the license. In dual licensing, GPL only could work if you, if you have some uh, cryptic infrastructure stuff which is buried deep into the commercial product. Otherwise, GPL cannot be used as a, as a second license in dual licensing. While with BSL, BSL works for any kind of software. And uh, BSL versus fair source licensing? Well, in fair source licensing, you have uh, usage limitation based on the number uh, of users, while uh, BSL just lets you make uh, more generic uh, restrictions, so it's up to the vendor to define these restrictions. And fair source licensing says that, well, we try to limit the number of, uh, of users, but try limiting the number of users of, of a database. Come on, it's, it's a very niche license that does not, only, does not always work for any kind of product, while with BSL you have a guarantee that the source will become open mm, after a certain amount of time. Cool. Let's now examine the fine print. What's actually inside the license? What makes it so unique from our perspective? Uh, first of all, a few, a few details on the change date. So the change date cannot be just any date. The change date is restricted to be within four years since the initial release. So you can select a shorter period, but never a longer period. So you cannot just say, okay, it will be 99 years and it will become free software after 99 years. Who, who would going to care about this software in 99 years? That's why we put a hard restriction in the license and you cannot modify it. If you decide to use BSL, you can set the term to no longer than four years. As I mentioned, once set the change date is fixed, it, it cannot be altered. So from the very beginning, when you see something licensed under BSL, you know the date is going to become uh, open source. Uh, the initial release, which triggers this timeline, does not have to be a GA release. You don't have to, to make it you know, general, generally available. Any, anything that goes public uh, is sufficient. So it could be a nightly build, it can be an alpha, a beta, an RC, whatever you want. Uh, as long as it's public, this is the starting date for this one, two, three, four years, whatever you say is good for your license. Uh, important thing on the change date, if you do a major release, or do a new release with lots of new functionality, it will, of course, restart the BSL period, but only on the new stuff that you just added into this release. So the, the previous version will still stay under its old timeline, uh, but the new things that you added will get a new BSL term available. A uh, few things on the change license. So the new license that is going to replace BSL. The most important thing, the new license must be an open source. You cannot cheat here, you cannot say you're going to put some other type of license, it has to be an open source license, and not just an open source license. Uh, it has to be at least GPL. The thing is, you can have more than one license if you want, but then again, one of them must be GPL. Uh, the decision whether to have more than one license is, of course, left to the licensor. So you can say, okay, I'm just happy, it will become GPL, I don't care about it. But you can say, okay, I prefer to have it uh, also available under BSD license or something more permissive than GPL so that other businesses could pick up the code and uh, benefit from it in, in other ways. How would you, as a developer, use BSL in uh, your product? Well, first of all, everybody can use BSL. It's not something that was created by MariaDB for MariaDB. It's something that was created by MariaDB for the community. So every developer can come in and pick up the BSL. Uh, the text is public. You just download it. And unlike things like GPL, which goes on for pages and pages and pages, BSL is just a couple of paragraphs long. So it's really easy to grasp and understand. It's important to know that by using BSL, you're bound by the text of the BSL. You cannot alter the text of the BSL uh, to, your, uh, to your own taste. If you do so, it will no longer be the original BSL license, of course. So you're bound by the wording, but you have the freedom to make all the necessary adjustments in the so-called parameters section. This is where you define the terms, uh, the substitute license, the change license, and uh, any free usage that you want to give uh, to the use of your product. So how do we actually do this? Well, just you take the header of the BSL license, put it into your uh, source code, and that's it. And typically, you would provide a link or provide the full text of the BSL uh, together bundled with your uh, product. You also have to set the change date, or rather the retention period for BSL, so one year, two year, whatever. And you have to specify which open source license or licenses are going to be in effect once BSL expires. 
a couple of common questions that uh, often come in when people start looking into BSL. So first of all, mixing BSL with non-BSL. Until the change date, the mixed code will be bound by both licenses. So the BSL part will stay under BSL, and whatever else came in, it will stay under its own license. But because when they're put together, they constitute a derived product, on the change date, they will both become GPL. Uh, modified code, as I said, uh, is a derivative work. BSL product can be used to develop products under different licenses. So if you have a development environment, which is BSL itself, it doesn't mean that the products that you develop with this environment are going to be BSL. No, you can, you can use whatever license you want as long as you don't borrow components that are distributed under uh, BSL. And one thing to know, of course, is that BSL and GPL are not compatible because BSL has the change date and BSL has a use limitation uh, and this is not compatible with uh, GPL. If you want to contribute to a BSL product, well, simply license your code to the vendor under the three clause BSD license. This will allow the vendor to incorporate the code uh, either by replacing the license with the BSL or simply by keeping it under the BSD license until the change date when it will become uh, GPL plus whatever else open source license is specified. Finally, backporting uh, from a newer version to older versions of BSL is not possible. You have to know about this because the newer version will probably have some new features, meaning new code, and this new code will have a new change date. So we can't backport things with a later change date to, uh, to a version that has uh, a more recent change date. And since you probably want to see a real life example on this, I'm going to quickly show you how we use BSL in MariaDB for our own products. First of all, we use this for, for software that we write ourselves. So we don't just take some third-party software, do some things with this, and, and release it. It's mostly for the products that we do from ground up. We don't like mixing in different licenses, different uh, origins um, of code. In MariaDB, we apply GPL version 2 or later as a change license. So we guarantee that whatever we have in the BSL, uh, whenever the change date comes, it will become a GPL version 2 or later if you prefer a later version uh, of GPL. We also use only a three-year retention period for the change date. So uh, it's not the allow the complete allowed for the full term of four years that is under the, the BSL, but we only use three years for this. So three years after the, the initial release, code becomes open source. A few products that we, that we release uh, under BSL to give you the sense of how this works with bigger products and how it works with smaller products. Uh, for example, with bigger products, well, we use, Marid uh, we use uh, BSL for the MariaDB Max Scale. If you have never heard of this, Max Scale is quite a versatile, modular, uh, load balancer, reverse proxy, orchestrator for the MariaDB environments. So it's, it's actually a flagship product for MariaDB uh, orchestration and management. Uh, and you can use Max Scale in production, so MariaDB says, with up to two MariaDB server nodes behind it without the needing to, to pay anything. So this is a good example that you can have BSL and you can still provide uh, production use uh, up to a certain extent without uh, the need to pay, contrary to what you have in uh, dual licensing and other models. Another very interesting uh, case. Now, if you want to exceed this limit of two servers, uh, then you need your actual backend service to be covered by a MariaDB subscription, which subscription bundles max scale free for you. So you still don't have to pay anything for the max scale product itself. You only have to get subscription, support subscription for your backend servers if their number set by max scale is more than two, which is the free usage. So a very good example that uh, in certain cases you can, you can still make money through BSL without actually charging anything for the product itself. Um, as I mentioned, it can also be used for smaller stuff. So, for example, we use BSL for little products like a change data capture adapter, or Kafka data streaming adapter, or uh, these, these are both max scale stuff, or a backup and restore tool for column store, which is uh, another product by MariaDB for analytics. These are all are relatively small add-ons for max uh, scale or for column store, and they can only make sense uh, to uh, together with the main product. So you can't really make any use of them uh, if you just got them. That's why uh, we don't have free usage for them because you, know, you need a bigger product uh, for them anyway. Uh, so you need to obtain a license for this even if you are 
don't have to pay a license for the bigger product. And this is an interesting case. So you can actually mix BSL and non-BSL stuff. An example, column store is GPL. Uh, you don't have to pay for using column store whatsoever. But if you want to use the backup and restore tool for column store, and you want to use a recent version of this backup and restore tool, then you have to get uh, a BSL a license for this. So a great example how you can make uh, two different licenses work together, and still you could benefit from this. And essentially, sustain your business out of this. So, as a conclusion to all this, after several years of running BSL stuff, we can clearly say that open source and monetization work together without making any compromise on this. And this is very, very important to us. So, BSL, from our perspective, is truly a win-win product. Why? Because it's useful to any kind of software that needs protection in order to be sufficiently monetized so that the business stays self-fueling. This is important. The business must be self-fueling. You cannot always live on somebody else's money. You cannot always live on um, venture capital, business angels, and so on. You have to become uh, self-fueling, self-sustaining at some point. And BSL helps to a great extent to this. It provides enough flexibility to any vendor to combine and set terms within its ecosystem up to its own taste and view on its own business. So it doesn't put uh, too much restrictions. It gives the flexibility. Uh, as you saw, you could use BSL in different terms for different products that you have and tailor it up to your uh, needs and up to your use cases. And finally, it gives firm guarantees to the end user that whatever is under BSL would eventually, in a known date, in a known moment in time, become free software under at least the GPL license, which again means that everything that you innovate would go back to the community, and the community will be able to learn from your experience and benefit from your experience. Uh, and we think this is, this is very important, and this actually helps us keep uh, our stuff true to the open source promise. That was it. It's now time for your questions. Questions from the audience? Anyone have any? What's the license for the uh, MariaDB Enterprise Server? Uh, MariaDB Enterprise Server is GPL. Because MariaDB Enterprise Server is a derivative work of the MariaDB uh, Server itself, so it's licensed at the GPL, but there are certain differences in the packaging and in the features which are uh, compiled, built in, in the binaries that we produce, and also certain differences uh, in the quality assurance process that we apply to these enterprise builds. But the product is still GPL. Any, any other questions? I actually wanted to ask, how do you audit the licenses for the different MariaDB um, editions, and if someone decides to extend MariaDB in some way, uh, who, does, who does the auditing and who does the validation of the licenses of the editions? Um. That's, that's why I mentioned that an important feature of the BSL is that it actually automatically changes its license without the need to go to the vendor or do any kind of auditing for this. If you have something under BSL and it says that this product, like MariaDB Mark Scale, will become open source in three years from the date of its original release, all you have to do is to check the date of the original release, which is, again, uh, it's in, in the timestamps, it's in your release notes, it's publicly available. So you don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to ask for permission or get some written statement that the, ch the license has been changed. It happens automatically. So on, the, on this particular day, this code becomes open source, and you can use it as any open source product for this. OK. Any other questions? OK. In OK, if case, we, don't, we don't have any further questions, please approach later. I'll be glad to answer. Yes, Asem will be available for more Q&A in the speaker's corner, ne near the open gaming corner. So please give him a round of applause. Thank you.